Hey, fifth graders, we're going to, we're on chapter 19 today. All right. Chapter 19, the acceptance of the Father's will. We'll spend more time on the creed, line, the item of the creed where it suffered death and was buried. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My Father, if it, is pos if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as you will. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Jesus says those words in the Garden of Gethsemane. At the time of the, as, a, as the time for the Passover drew near, Jesus came to Jerusalem. At this time of year, thousands of Jews were visiting in a holy city. Word had spread that Jesus was coming. The people gathered in great excitement. They had heard how Jesus brought Lazarus back to life only a few days before. As Jesus rode into the city, the crowd shouted joyfully, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. They waved palm branches and laid down on the road, laid them down on the road before them. They even placed their cloaks on the dusty ground in order to make a welcome carpet for him. Priests and Pharisees watched in anger. The people no longer cared what these men had to say about Jesus. Look, the entire world has run after him, they muttered. They decided to speed up their plans to put Jesus to death. So here we have what's called Palm Sunday. And uh, the uh, welcome of palm branches, which is very much a, a messianic. And what welcoming is, has, is that the anointed one as a king. And the laying their cloaks down is idea of they're, they're putting, there's the symbolic gesture of that, you know, has mentioned making a welcoming carpet in that sense, but but also kind of submitting them to themselves. You're our king. We want to be under your rule. As for Jesus, he knew that the excitement of the crowd would die down in a few days. He knew that most of these people would not be around to protest his death sentence or comfort him while he suffered. Several times in the past months, Jesus warned his disciples of what would happen. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written of the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And they will scour scourge him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise. So here's even, uh, so he's, Jesus knows he's going up to Jerusalem and he's going to be um, uh, kind of put to death. The children of the Hebrews carrying olive branches went to meet the Lord crying out and saying, Hosanna in the highest. From Palm Sunday procession antiphon, so the uh, opening kind of prayer, if sometimes is sometimes uh, opening kind of, you could say, Verse uh, is sometimes used. Sometimes used. Hosanna in the highest. Uh, Hosanna means it's kind of this joy, this cry of save us, You've, or you know, uh, deliver us in the highest. So kind of you, this this cry of of joy that you've come to save us. Uh, the Gospels tell us that the disciples did not make did not understand when Jesus spoke to them like this, referring to his his. Uh, passion, his suffering, death, and resurrection. And they're like, what is he talking about? These words were clear enough, but perhaps the disciples found the idea of Jesus' death just too terrible to expect, to accept. Like most people, the disciples were expecting Jesus to use his power to set himself as king of Israel. They did not see that Jesus came on earth to save us from our sins and lead us to a heavenly kingdom. But Jesus clearly understood what his father wanted him of him. He accepted the cross, knowing that his act of obedience would save the world from sin and death. He mentioned it several times while preaching to the people. In the parable of the Good Shepherd, Jesus pointed out that he was not going to be trapped into death against his will, but that he chose it freely. I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. 
So he's kind of this idea of the certain Jesus. He's you know he's fully God, uh, and so he's in he's in as as in control of kind of uh, he's not being forced into these things. He's kind of freely letting himself uh, when his death comes. He's allowing himself uh, and. Uh, John's gospel, where this is from, uh, particularly emphasizes Jesus as in control at the passion. Even all these this chaos is going on around him, it looks like he's you know kind of these things are happening to him. He's he's kind of firm. He knows what he's about, doing the Father's will, uh, and offering his life in obedience and love uh, for our salvation. Another time, Jesus made it plain that he had to die for the good of others, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The Last Supper. Knowing the end was near, Jesus gathered his disciples for their last Passover supper together. The disciples had been quarreling over which of them most deserved to sit close to Jesus when he established the kingdom of heaven. Without a word, Jesus taught them a great lesson in humility. He took the place of a servant and washed their feet. The disciples were astonished and saddened when Jesus said one of them would betray him. He identified Judas, who had got up and left. Most of the disciples, however, did not realize what was happening and thought that Jesus had sent Judas on an errand. So, um, going back here, so they're, this, uh, in the Last Supper, the, the disciples, the third, they, this is the third time actually they're quarreling about who's, who's going to be greatest in Jesus' kingdom when he establishes his kingdom. Uh, and so Jesus said, no, he kind of, each time he kind of, uh, kind of responds the impo of with, no, it's not about power. It's about service and humbling oneself. That's what Jesus does, kind of washing their feet. And then he humbles himself by, through his death, kind of allowing himself to die for our salvation. So Judas uh, then leaves and uh, has already plotted to, to hand Jesus over. Uh, there came a moment at the Last Supper that was important not only for the disciples, but for every Christian who would ever live. Our Lord took bread, blessed it, broke it, and said, Take this. This is my body. Then he took a cup of wine. This is the chalice of my blood, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This was the first Holy Eucharist. We say that the Holy, Holy Thursday is the day Christ instituted, began, the Holy Eucharist. On that day, he also gave the apostles the power to consecrate the bread and wine. When he said, do this in memory of me. The Last Supper was the very first Mass. Jesus also institute the sac instituted the Sacrament of Holy Orders at this time. So the apostles were the first priests of the New Covenant. Uh, this includes the priesthood by which a man is given the power to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus. Always in Jesus' name. So as a priest, I can't do it on my own powers because of Jesus' special delegation uh, and uh, Jesus uh, working through the priest when he says the same words that Jesus said. After the Last Supper, Jesus took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. With Gethsemane means olive press. There were olive trees there, and so that's where they would. There was a big press also they they found in that garden, Gethsemane. So the Jesus, is, in a certain sense, will see he's going to suffer kind of a internal kind of agony, you know, the sadness of what he's, he's preparing to, to suffer for. There he began to feel afraid at the very thought of the suffering he would undergo. Father, Jesus prayed, if it is possible, take this cup away from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. The thought of our sins and gratitude hurt the loving heart of Jesus even more than the thought of dying. In his sorrow and agony, Jesus began to sweat blood. God the Father sent an angel to comfort Jesus and strengthen him for the terrible hours ahead. Judas came, leading a crowd of temple guards and soldiers to arrest Jesus. The disciples ran away, and Jesus was taken before Caiaphas, the high priest. The chief priest accused him of blasphemy. Uh, and he and the other members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, sentenced him to death. Uh, blasphemy, because Jesus, he makes a, he's declaring himself to be God. Being under the rule of Roman government, they could not carry out this sentence legally. All right, 
So they took Jesus before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. So they want to get Jesus, not they don't just want to kill him, but they want to make a big public show that he's an enemy uh, of, uh, of the state. No, you know, kind of make a big example of him. All right. Because we see in the New Testament Acts, they, they stone St. Stephen. He's the first martyr. Uh, we'll get to that late in later chapters. Uh, they didn't take him before Pilate, but they want Jesus to be publicly put to death, kind of in a through crucifixion in a terrible way to make uh, to really get their case home. All right, they don't just want to, you know, uh, kill Jesus behind the shed, if you will. Uh, they want to make a big public example of him. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the Jewish leaders attempted to convince Pilate that Jesus was a dangerous criminal who wanted to overthrow the Roman emperor. Pilate knew there was no case against Jesus, and he tried to satisfy the angry crowd by having Jesus scourged. But the crowd insisted that he be put to death. Pilate, afraid of the people, finally agreed to have Jesus crucified. In addition to that is, uh, before before the people started cr calling out crucifixion, um, Pilate, the, the Jewish leaders... They change their, their their accusation. They say, well, you know, he's against the state. He wants to overthrow Rome. And then they say, well, he also makes himself God, God, the son of God. And Pilate's like, whoa, is Jesus, are you a... Now, G Pilate is a, is a pagan. He doesn't believe, he's, not, he's not a Jew, so he doesn't believe in the you know one true God. But he's like, whoa, Jesus, if you're, you're divine, I, I shouldn't... Uh, so Pilate, Pilate is interflicted, uh, but the... Kind of the pressure, the pure pressure of the people. Say, Pilate's like, okay, well, I'll just uh, hand him over. So he, he caves, even though he knows Jesus is innocent, he caves to the pressure of the people. Scripture and tradition tell us of the painful journey Jesus made carrying the cross to Calvary. One of the disciples, John, along with Mary and a few of Jesus' women followers, were with him as he hung upon the cross between two thieves. Before he died, Jesus asked the Father to forgive his enemies. Even in the most painful moments, he thought of others with love. He forgave the good thief and promised, This day you will be with me in paradise. He said he saw his mother with the youngest, his youngest disciple and said, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. With these words, Jesus gave Mary to be Garrett married to the whole world to be this, a spiritual mother to all of God's children. Our Lord's last words were a final act of surrender to the will of the Father. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. With these words, Jesus died. So, so Jesus follows the will of the Father. Now this is, uh, you know, we think, oh, the Father has a separate will than Jesus. Well, the, the, there's one divine will, all right? So the Father and the Son share the same one divine will. But Jesus has a human will. So in, in the agony in the garden, when he's suffering, and then on the cross, he's really it's show, he's submitting, he's showing, externalizing, manifesting how he's he's submitting his human human will, all right, uh, to the to the divine will as an example for you and me, the importance of kind of uh, putting ourselves under God's will. So word Eucharist we have here, so with Jesus uh, sacrament, Jesus institute at the Last Supper which actually points forward to the cross, because he says, this is my body, uh, which I've given up for you. This is the chalice of my blood that will be poured out. What is he? he pours out his blood the next day. So the Eucharist anticipates his death and resurrection. When we celebrate Mass, it's kind of, there's the reverse. The, uh, it's already happened, but the graces from, um, uh, from that are, are kind of made present at Mass. We'll, we'll get into that at some point, all right? Either... I don't know if later on we, we spend a lot of time on that in this chapter. I know in sixth grade we for sure will spend a lot more on how maybe how to better understand that. What did Jesus Christ accomplish during his earthly life? Well, he taught us by word and deed how to live according to God's plan, so both by his words and his actions, and he confirmed his words by his miracles. Finally, he sacrificed himself on the cross to cancel our debt of sin to reconcile us with the Father, and to reopen heaven to us. As God's only Son, he is the only mediator between God and man. He kind of bridges the gap between us and and God. All right? Now, he is God, 
but it's his humanity. He becomes man to try and draw us back into communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's an important part of his sacrifice, offering himself. It's loving obedience. Those are the two very important virtues that he's in. And it's through love and obedience. It's infinite love and obedience that, that kind of is what's the core of it. It's not Jesus. Is Father, God the Father is not punishing Jesus. Uh, some of our bro Protestant brothers and sisters uh, have that kind of that type of view. No, Jesus is offering himself. It's the love, loving obedience that Jesus offers that is then able to cancel out our sin when it's applied to us. All right, so we'll get to how exactly that applies to us uh, later, uh, especially with the sacraments. What did Jesus, in when did Jesus institute the Last Supper? Uh, the when did Jesus institute the Eucharist? At the Last Supper, when he said, he took bread and wine and said, this is my body, this is my blood. When did Jesus institute the Holy Priesthood? At the Last Supper, when he said, do this in memory of me to the Apostles. So that's very um, a kind of priestly language. In the book of Exodus, a similar kind of priestly. When the Passover lamb is sacrificed and such, God says they're to do this in memory of God saving, bringing them out of Egypt. So Jesus uses this kind of the same type of priestly language. It's a new Passover, not from Egyptian slavery, but from sin and death into uh, the new life of grace, new creation of grace. All right, the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is one of the most treasured possessions of the church. It is believed to be the burial cloth of Jesus. So the linen that they bury Jesus in. On the Shroud is an imprint of the crucified Christ. Uh, see here. The image is very detailed, with especially which especially shows when the is, is photographed and turned into a negative. Means it's all the, the black and white are opposite colors. Um, I can do that right here. Watch this. I'm going to do a negative. Oh no, I can't. I don't have that setting on. No, no, never mind. All right, I do. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we can see the marks of the nails into the hands and feet of our Lord, the wounds from the scourging and crown of thorns, and the wound in his side from the soldier's spear. In recent years, scientists of all faith have been studying the Shroud of Turin. They have made many discoveries and support the belief that the Shroud is, the tr is truly the burial cloth of Jesus, that the image on it is miraculous. All right, this is 2,000 years old, this lineage, and it's still, still have it today. So here's the, uh, down here on your previous page, you're like, what are these things? Really black and white. So here's the, here's the Shroud, kind of, you can see kind of the imprint. Um, I'm trying to think of what that I guess I'd have to I don't know what part this is exactly so that's kind of it's kind of hard to these two but this one here is probably the more famous part it's his face all right so of the, the cloth that was over his face you because they put ointments on him they anointed him and stuff and then buried him uh, and so it kind of you could say his Kind of the features of his face, kind of with the ointment, kind of conform, and the uh, linen shroud. Uh, it's called the shroud of Turin because that's where it was kept for so long. Uh, it's believed to be the burial cloth of Jesus, and it's kind of they don't know how how it, this is imprinted, nor how it's still kind of still in present case state. You know, it's, you had a piece. If you had a T-shirt or whatever, I think after a thousand years, it probably would decay. <laughs> um, they don't know how, they can't explain uh, many of the features or, or the kind of the, why it's still, still here, as it is. All right. Okay, our saint today is St. George the Younger. Okay, well, a saint with a more normal name, I guess. <laughs> uh, St. George the Younger was born in Mytilene, Greece, in the 8th century. Because he was very rich, he was able to use his wealth to help the sick and the poor. George felt called to follow Christ, so he gave away all his possessions and became a monk in the local monastery. He practiced his faith with such care that he was made Bishop of Mytilene. As bishop, the, 
uh, the saint continued his great generosity and his devout following of Christ. When persecution came under Leo the Emperor Leo the Armenian, George George stood firm for the Catholic Church and spoke out against the destruction of holy statues. The saintly bishop was then sent into exile at uh, Kesaronis. His, he offered his suffering in union with those of Christ for the conversion of sinners. He was called to his eternal reward in 816. When the saints' relics were uh, returned to Mytilene, many miracles were recorded. George is called the Younger to differentiate him from two previous bishops of Mytilene who are also saints. So only one of them was also a George. <laughs> So, St. George, pray for us, help us remain firm in the faith, uh, and uh, to uphold the Catholic faith always in our words and in our deeds. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.